In 1862, the U.S. was embroiled in a bloody civil war. Union and Confederate troops were deep in the throes of an intense conflict over states' dominion, the economics of slavery, and sectional friction. Therefore, Lincoln's government paid little attention to a sovereign Indian nation attempting to use diplomatic strategies to feed their starving people. The freedom of African Americans that the Union fought for is the same that the U.S. fought to keep from the Sioux. This led to young, disenfranchised Sioux braves, anxious to prove themselves, to clash with settlers, ignorant of the nation's efforts to peacefully resolve their grievances. What started out as a relatively minor conflict drew to a head, and not only threatened the region, but the security of the entire Union. This pivotal conflict that spanned only five weeks would become known as the Dakota Uprising. The Sioux were a semi-nomadic tribe who followed the buffalo as the majestic animals grazed and roamed the American Midwest. Much of Sioux culture, spiritual beliefs, and dietary customs centered on the American bison. The indigenous peoples traveled from modern-day Minnesota to Montana and as far south as Colorado in search of the buffalo. The Sioux's wanderings led them to encounter travelers making their way west looking for land to settle. Over time, the settlers' farms and towns impacted the migration routes, as well as the number of buffalo available to hunt. This led to armed conflicts between the Sioux and the settlers. Yet, in an act of two-sided diplomacy, the Traverse de Sioux Treaty was enacted. Meetings between council members of the Sioux Nation and regional representatives of the U.S. government, known as Indian agents, began in earnest. The specifics of the treaty outlined the boundaries of the new reservation along with reserved land for hunting. The treaty also promised each member of the tribe would receive an annuity payment from the U.S. government. It went as far as to broker deals with local traders for select trading rights. The treaty was ratified by a delegation of Sioux in Washington on July 23, 1851. Despite the good nature and optimism of the peace talks and subsequent treaty, in a matter of months, the Sioux were once again forgotten by the U.S. government. President Lincoln and his administration washed their hands of the matter, leaving the Sioux to starve on a land where nothing grew and no animals grazed. Clashes with settlers once again erupted. Little Crow, a prominent Sioux war chief, spoke out in an attempt to bring the plight of his people back to the forefront of U.S. domestic policy. He sent several eloquent and diplomatic letters to regional Indian agents as well as the U.S. government requesting the government's assistance in feeding his people. John R. Brown, a Minnesota Indian agent, attempted to squelch further violence by hashing out trading deals in recognition of the government's inability to pay annuities. The U.S. government claimed the funds were held in reserve, a reserve now destined to pay for a civil war the Lincoln administration saw no immediate end to. Despite the Sioux's best efforts, settlers, shop owners, and traders armed with anti-Indian biases and suspicions refused to sell or give credit on goods the Sioux needed for fear the government would not reimburse them. Many influential and frustrated Sioux war chiefs abandoned debates and threatened further violence. As the annuity system broke down, so did the good hope rhetoric of fair treatment and diplomacy toward the Sioux, as illustrated by this terse comment by prominent trader Andrew Myrick. Angered by comments such as Myrick's, young Sioux braves, under Little Crow's leadership, were now even more incensed and eager to go to war. On Sunday, August 17th, a small warring party of Sioux attacked Litchfield, Minnesota, killing four settlers. Later in the afternoon of the same day, Little Crow, now in the minority, capitulated to his war council to avoid an internal conflict. The next day, Monday, August 18th, a much larger war party of Sioux attacked the Redwood Agency, killing 44 settlers and capturing 10. A hastily assembled state militia was mobilized. The militia arrived at Redwood as the last of the Sioux warriors left the site of the latest massacre. 
Minnesota Governor Alexander Ramsey soon received the news about Redwood. Enraged, Ramsey put Colonel Henry H. Sibley, a competent yet inexperienced soldier, in charge of quashing what the governor now perceived as a major Indian rebellion. On Tuesday, August 19th, the township of New Ulm was attacked. The Sioux descended on the town, killing men, women, and children alike. As quickly as they appeared, the Sioux warriors vanished, leaving the town razed, buildings burning, and 16 settlers dead. In the wake of the attack, survivors such as Helen Tarble, later author of The Story of My Capture and Escape During the Minnesota Indian Massacre of 1862, as well as daily newspaper articles, convinced thousands of settlers to flee the region. Federal troops diverted from fighting the Confederates arrived and immediately clashed with the Sioux War Parties. The bloodiest and most dramatic battles took place over the days following the Federal troops' arrival. The Second Battle of New Ulm, an attack on Fort Ridgely, and most significantly, the Battle of Birch Coulee. Bolstered by significant wins on the battlefield, and while the war raged on around him, Little Crow reached out to the settlers, Indian agents, and the U.S. government in a final attempt at diplomacy. He once again outlined the events that precipitated the conflict and possible peaceful resolutions. There was no response. With any hope of diplomacy vanquished, the Sioux witnessed unparalleled U.S. aggression. U.S. and Minnesotan state troops took hundreds of prisoners, even though an overwhelming majority of the Sioux opposed the war against the settlers. In an attempt to stop further attacks on settlers by the Sioux War Parties, a peaceful group of Sioux that looked favorably on the U.S. government called Friendlies negotiated the release of innumerable settlers and troops, while at the same time ignoring Colonel Sibley's indiscriminate capture of Sioux women, men, and children. Little Crow mounted one last major offensive known as the Battle of Wood Lake. Colonel Sibley effectively defeated the Sioux at Wood Lake, capturing over 800 warriors and thus ending the Dakota Uprising. Colonel Sibley immediately called for the capture and internment of the remaining Sioux warring parties. He created a committee to conduct a thorough assessment of the damages sustained during the five-week conflict. The committee convicted some 300 Sioux and condemned them to death without due process. Not all among the settlers were in favor of such a severe punishment. Bishop Henry Benjamin Whipple advocated for those Sioux that were truly innocent to be released. He forwarded a letter to President Lincoln addressing the illegal and ethical violations and implications if the death sentences were to take place. President Lincoln, with his focus still squarely on preserving the Union, hesitantly stepped in to put an end to the violence of what he still considered a minor irritation. Under his direction, no Sioux would be hanged without his direct approval and required each case to be thoroughly reviewed to ensure the convictions were legally binding. Subsequently, the list was reduced from 300 to 38. The day after Christmas in 1862, 38 sovereign Sioux citizens were hanged for committing either murder or rape. Their families stood by and wept as hundreds of Minnesotan settlers cheered with relief. In the same month as the hangings, Lincoln put in motion a plan to subjugate a proud yet struggling sovereign nation. U.S. troops separated families, relocating thousands of Sioux to the Dakotas, imprisoning them in some of the country's first internment camps. What could have been a major victory for American diplomatic doctrine, foreign or domestic, became the epitome of failure in debate and diplomacy. For many in the U.S., the Indian-U.S. government conflict known as the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890 marked the end of the Indian problem for the country. This reality is far removed from the truth. The first Sioux were released from the Dakota internment camps at the turn of the century, the last in the 1910s, nearly 40 years after the Dakota Uprising. Many say the Dakota Uprising marked the beginning of the Sioux struggle for equity, sovereignty, and self-determination. Now, 160 years later, the struggle for these inalienable rights provided by dozens of treaties continues to be trampled, pitted against modern-day upheavals and political vice. The strength of debate and diplomacy, with its power to swage people, runs as strong with all American Indians now as it did with the Sioux in 1862.